recording. And we are now recording. And we're going to get this um, uh, virtual gathering started for today. This is the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Working Group preparing future generations of Indigenous geoscience professionals, educators, and workforce. And this has been brought to you by the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, Haskell Indian Nations University, the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center, the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, um, Paulette Blanchard at the University of Kansas, and Sharina Baker from University of New Mexico. And we want to thank you um, on behalf of our planning team um, for everybody to joining us today and to um, Dr. Wendy Smythe and Dr. Jeremy Gwynn for joining us um, and presenting and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Um, before we um, got into the two um, presentations, I just wanted to make a couple quick announcements. Um, our next gathering will be on July 16th at 1 p.m. Pacific. We are working on a YouTube channel and website um, so that way we can um, streamline this information and it's a one-stop shop for you to find recordings, um, you know, future information on gatherings, whether in person or virtual. Um, so we will send out the information once everything is established and ready to go. In the meantime, you can find the webinar recordings and registration links at the Southwest CASC um, website, which is this link right here. Um, and also please subscribe to our newsletter where information like this group will be shared as well as other information across the region is shared um, in respect to climate resources. And then also please subscribe to the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center newsletter. The link is right here um, where you can find information climate resources um, for the North Central region. And I did want to make a quick plug for my colleague Aran Sisu. Um, the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center does have a Global Change Fellows Program at North Carolina State University. So if there's any students who are at NC State and are looking for some opportunities as a graduate student, um, please visit the link at the top of the screen or please feel free to reach out to Aran Sisu and her email is at the bottom of the screen and I can put that in the chat here. Um, so without further ado, um, we want to get into the presentations and provide the presenters that time and we will have Q&A um, after both presenters are um, done and we will have about 15-20 minutes at the end to, um, for questions and answers. So um, I will ask Jeremy um, to begin sharing his screen and um, if you could start with introducing yourself. Hey, sure, thank you. Um, let me get my screen up. Okay, thank you very much. It, it's really an honor to uh, have this time to speak with you. I am, my name is Jeremy Gwynn. I'm at United Tribes Technical College and we're located in Bismarck, North Dakota. And I'm, I'm gonna talk today mostly about the Intertribal Research and Resource Center. Uh, it is an entity of United Tribes, so even though I'll talk about uh, some ways it's separate from the academic programs, uh, we're still very much part of, of United Tribes. Uh, I'm excited about this opportunity to, to speak about our programs and our communities and the people involved. So, so thank you very much for, for having this time and uh, for joining us. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing that such a large group of people are, are able to come together this way. Um, so I've been at tribal colleges for about 15 years. I'm a wildlife biologist and I, I was a faculty member for a long time. Um, I just became the director of the research center when we opened it about a year and a half ago. And although we're fairly young, a year and a half uh, old, um, we, we, a lot of these concepts and ideas have been around for, for quite a while. So, so it's taken a, a long time to build partnerships and to, to build concepts that are built into this uh, research center. So today I'll talk a little bit about uh, STEM programs at the college and how uh, we're working to an enhance training in environmental sciences and geosciences, uh, uh, GIS and climate related uh, activities. So I'll talk about the academic programs of the college uh, specifically the environmental science program, which is our, our main science program. 
and then about the, the IRRC, the Intertribal Research and Resource Center. Um, so United Tribes is part of AHEC. Uh, we were founded in 1969 as the second tribal college uh, and we're located in Bismarck, like I said. Uh, the tribal nations of North Dakota came together to build a center of, of higher education for their people uh, back in the late 60s as they realized that, that kind of mainstream higher ed was just not working for their people. So they came together and built the United Tribes uh, Technical College, uh, had different names uh, as it moved through history, but, um, but nonetheless, this was a center built for their people uh, to have access to, to higher education. And we still maintain really close ties to tribal leadership. Uh, it's the, the leaders of the five tribes in North Dakota make up the board of directors for our college and, and provide leadership and, and direction for our, our activities, including this, the science and engineering programs. Uh, we have this foundation as an intertribal entity and that really, really serves to be the, the, the foundation of what we do in the science program as well and has really followed us throughout our history. So STEM programs at, at tribal colleges in general are, are very young. Our program really developed in the early to mid 2000s um, and have grown very rapidly. We offer an associate's degree and a BS degree in environmental science at, at United Tribes. Uh, it includes, includes uh, courses, the foundational courses that you see here, uh, which fit really well with the, the topics that we're talking about today uh, with this group, including things like soil science and, and geology and weather and climate, hydro, uh, hydrogeology. Just recently, we had a, a bit of a change to get back to, to the roots of the environmental science program as as more of this environmental program, as we had uh, we drifted into more straight biology over the last few years. So, um, along with the development of this research center, uh, our academic program has also kind of refocused and, and brought us back to to what we were founded on. Our facilities are fantastic. This is not a <laughs> an image of our facilities, but but we have a beautiful science building. Um, we've really grown quickly, as I mentioned before, and, and we're doing research at a very competitive level now. Um, there's not a lot of us. We're, we're still small um, in enrollment and in faculty numbers, um, but the quality of our programs are really at a, a very high level. Um, for the past few years, we felt really good about the academic program and how we were, we were preparing students who came in from all over the country uh, to United Tribes, and we felt very good about what they were learning, how they were applying uh, the, the topics in science to their local issues, um, whether it's um, their home in, in New Mexico or whether it's home on Standing Rock. We felt really good about where they were going and how they were using the, the skills that they learned to develop um, as scientists and, and give back to their community. Uh, but, but a number of us felt like we were not really working on solid projects with the, the communities that we serve. Um, when, you, when you only have a few science faculty in a, in a college and high teaching loads, really heavy loads of, of teaching, it's very hard to get out and, and work in the communities the way we, we all wanted to. So a little over a year ago, we had an opportunity that came up uh, within the NSF uh, tribal college program. And it was to develop a center that would be separate from our ac academic programs. Um, so through the planning process, which is kind of what you see on the, the screen here, through this rather intensive planning process in order to think about what we would develop if we could develop anything uh, as far as a center, we looked at, at our strengths and we realized that we have strengths in student research training, uh, we've always been, throughout our history, we've been a, a centralized location for, for tribal members to come and receive training. Uh, we have really strong partnerships in state, federal, mm -hmm. and tribal agencies, and we have a, a really unique um, mix of both field and lab components within our program and within our, our faculty uh, team. So we knew there were also opportunities. So within the academic year, uh, 
there's not a lot of uh, faculty research or community programs going on because we're so tied to the classroom. Uh, and then this idea of that direct work with the tribal communities, there, there's some, there's, it just could be improved. And so we saw those as opportunities. We also reached out to our community advisory boards and our, our community um, members, uh, both within our student body and, and, and uh, community members that aren't associated with the college. And we saw there were needs in research, um, lots of areas where we could work in research. There were training needs for tribal uh, agency employees, um, technical assistance such as um, proposal writing or, or technical sampling of environmental um, conditions. Uh, and then a very large bit that we could do within the K through 12 uh, system. Uh, we saw many, many of the schools were cutting science programs or relegating science to, to after school programs. And then we also saw that many after school programs were losing funding. And so we, we just saw that as a really um, a big need that we could do something about. Uh, the, the partners that we had, like I said, state and federal and tribal agencies, we have really strong university co collaborations, but we also saw um, many of the networks and alliances, uh, many of you are on the, the call today, that we really hadn't tapped into and, and hadn't communicated with. So we saw that as an opportunity as well. So the more we talked and the more we listened, we, we kept coming back to three three ideas, the food, energy, and water uh, kept coming back uh, routinely in, in the discussions that we had. Um, and we work on these, these in some capacity, our, our land grant, um, we are a land grant institution and our land grant department works, uh, does a lot of work in food and nutrition areas. Uh, we also work on traditional plant and animal food populations. Um, Energy, of course, there's massive energy development in this region and in the north and the, the Bakken. Uh, no Dapple was just uh, about 40 miles south of where we are. Um, and then water, of course, um, drinking water and surface water, constant concerns uh, for the communities that, that we serve. So initially we discussed these, these concepts as individual parts. So which one of these would we, would we try to develop our center around? And the more we talked about it, the more that it just really made sense to approach it uh, in a holistic manner because they're, they're inextricably, inextricably connected. And it, it really made sense for us to do that. So we looked at food, energy, and water as a complete system. Um, the, there's many opportunities on multiple scales for research, for uh, outreach, for training, uh, and for educational um, programs. Um, this also, offered us a chance to be flexible in um, where we wanted the center to go and in the future what the center could work on. So this broad theme, food, energy, and water, uh, was very kind of overarching. It's an umbrella, if you, if you will. So this includes things such as climate, like we're talking about today, uh, environmental change, resiliency within our communities, transitions, um, both within our communities and as we're as we're looking at climate change and how we might, what we might be in the future as far as how we respond to, to climate and how resilient we are to those things, that, that transition periods. And then of course, the, going back to that inner tribal nature that we, we, our foundation was built on, this was an opportunity for us to work with many tribes, uh, particularly in the Northern Plains area, um, but also nationally on issues that, that affect all of us. And I don't think there's any, any individual or any community that's not affected by food, energy, and water um, issues. Um, so we, we put those three things together. Um, this was a graphic that I, I pulled to just show, again, that, that nexus that, that we work on um, and that, that many people are working on um, for food, energy, and water. And so, so that's what we ran with. The mission of the, the IRC is to provide services and build capacity for enhancing food, energy, and water sustainability for the Northern Plains communities um, or for tribal communities in the Northern Plains through these four areas, research, outreach, training, and education. Um, and that's our, that's our mission and kind of using more and more input from our advisory team we built the center to function in those four areas because 
they felt it was important that we touch on those, those four kind of categories. Um, so our research focuses on food. We have agricultural research, uh, traditional plants and animal populations, energy. We have re uh, research on renewables, contamination, opportunities within um, energy for new uh, innovative programs. Uh, we have research in water areas such as quality, uh, resiliency to droughts and floods. Um, and our, our STEM uh, outreach coordinator is also uh, working on a PhD in STEM education. So we're able to see how our programs really have, a, have an impact on learning. And so the, the last bullet there is really about STEM education. Our two, uh, two research faculty that are within the, the IRC, uh, Dr. Gorjot Dhaliwal works in uh, renewable energy and biomaterials and, and specifically in agricultural areas. And Dr. Emily Begain works in uh, environmental toxicology and pollution, and especially how those things impact cellular function, uh, including things like cancer. And so, so suddenly we're doing research in cancer and, and biomaterials engineering, which um, you know a year and a half ago we hadn't really touched on. Um, so that the the IRC, the the center opportunity, has really been transformative in how we function both on the ground, but also out in tribal communities. And that leads us into our outreach. This is kind of a busy slide. Um, I can never cut down my photos because I always wanna see, <laughs> see the kids in the photos. Um, so we do have a full-time 12 month STEM outreach coordinator. Um, she's fantastic. She came from a, a science teaching background. And so she's able to understand how our, our research or activities within the the center, how that communicates to um, the, the K through 12 systems and the standards that the teachers have to meet. Uh, so it's been really a, a really nice partnership there uh, with her. Uh, we have full family programs, uh, including for all ages and collaborations with our local science center, the Gateway to Science program in, in North Dakota. Uh, we have monthly nature walks although we've, we've had to curtail those for the summer. Um, and then in year one of this program, we've reached over 3,000 um, participants in our programs. Uh, this includes um, you know, kindergarten students all the way, or pre-K students all the way up to uh, our oldest participants. So, um, and from all over the, the state and, and really, really outside the state as well. So during the, the, the COVID-19 um, experience, we've had to adapt some of these um, some of these programs that we intended. We had a, a kind of a full summer planned out of, of different activities. And so instead we've, we've developed enhanced online um, footprint. And so our, our website is easy to find. If you just Google UTTC and IRRC, uh, it'll pop up as the first thing on Google. Um, it's a very easy website to find. Uh, and on there, there's two buttons, the Phenology Friday resource and the at-home STEM uh, activity guides. And so the STEM activity guides are, are kind of more um, family-oriented, uh, longer, takes a little bit longer time period to do. These are, uh, you know, STEM modules that, that anybody can do with really limited um, kind of household supplies. Uh, and if you click on one of those buttons, it brings you to the full screen. Um, these were released basically weekly uh, over the last month or so. And you see some of the, some of the titles there, Bat Women and the Dark Knight. Uh, each of those uh, activity modules showcases both the module and the STEM uh, learning concept, but also the, the students and the faculty that are involved in developing those. So it's a really nice way to get to know our students and our faculty uh, while, while doing some kind of in, engaging STEM activity at home. So feel free to, to check those out um, and download them as you see fit. They're really, really kind of fun activities. Uh, and then also every Friday we release the Phenology Friday uh, program. So this group probably knows, knows phenology, but it's the, the study of seasonal changes and changes uh, based on timing. Um, throughout the throughout the year. And so 
it was fortunate that that all this kind of happened in the springtime because as in the north anyway as we look at migration patterns and and uh, plant buds and things like that coming out it was, it was really a nice time for phenology fridays and and uh, there's there's a few examples that are listed here uh, the last one case studies i'll talk about uh, in just a minute then we also have our, our training program, and this is primarily focused on, on tribal agency personnel uh, and, and K through 12 teaching trainings. Um, these programs are, are based on what types of activities or what types of needs were described to us um, by, by our tribal advisory boards and tribal members. And so we've developed a, a a solid group. We've partnered with uh, folks like Stefan to bring in um, more advanced training and in some areas that we don't have as much experience. And, and we really uh, were able to get a, a few of these out the door before COVID shut down our workshops. We haven't adapted uh, many of these trainings to, uh, to online yet. Although um, at the end of the summer, by the end of the summer, we are going to be offering some GIS training that's free and available online through our partners at NASA. And, and that'll be a program that is housed on our website and is, is free and available um, throughout, the, throughout the year. You can take it at any time. Um, and I'll, I'll try to provide more information about that as, as it comes available. Uh, we also provide uh, professional development in, for, for United Tribes faculty and staff, but this would also be available to, to anyone that's interested. Uh, in things like proposal development and telling the telling the story in order to get the funds. Um, and then also data visualization. So we're working on the backside to help uh, to help scientists publish or to help to help students publish their um, their findings in in scientific uh, publications. And then finally, we, we had a series of workshops based on solar energy and solar panel installation. Um, this was a, a project that that happened as a kind of fortuitous partnerships, and we were able to kind of tap into those um, those folks and partners who really wanted to work with us at a very very critical time. Is it, it, it was amazing how everything just fell into place, um, and I'll talk about that in one second as well. All of these things are community based, so students, community members. Folks that are just walking down the street sometimes have, have entered our, our programs and have taken part and it's, it's always been a fantastic um, a time to, to visit and to learn more. And so, so it's completely community based. Um, this is the, the solar, one, the product of one of our solar uh, workshops. This is the, the solar roller and some of you may have seen um, articles about this. Uh, this is a, a solar installation, a community build where, where the community workshop actually built this uh, trailer and installed the, uh, the solar panels on the trailer. And the, the team, the partners are listed here. This includes uh, a solar company called Light Spring, uh, Rock Industries, which is a, a company on Standing Rock, and Indigenized Energy, uh, which you may be familiar with, with the large solar array down at Cannonball, North Dakota, uh, and then Sojourn Architect. And this was a community built project, like I said, um, throughout workshops, we installed these panels. We all learned a lot as we were going through. And then this, this helped uh, provide service at our, our powwow. So it helped run the lights at the powwow, the, the United Tribes International powwow last year. Um, and we are working since the powwow. We've been working on developing modules uh, that would be used for outreach. So this thing will go on the the circuit and uh, be traveling around. That was one of our summer plans: was to have this go to powwows and other community events that we were invited to, to provide uh, free access to uh, STEM outreach activities uh, in in our tribal communities. And I know I'm getting a little late on time, so I'll go fast here. Uh, the case studies that I mentioned before, we, we all know there's incidents that happen and occur on, on our tribal communities and within the reservations. And one of the things that, that I realized quickly as we were trying to develop our environmental programs is that 
we often don't have case studies to, to work off of. Uh, we don't have these, these documented or um, they're not shared in a specific area. And so this is an area that we wanted to work on is to develop case studies, particularly for the Northern Plains and tribal communities. So this was an incident that happened on Standing Rock in, in 2016. One of my students was very interested in it. And so we, we built a full case study uh, called Pesticides on the Prairie. And this is available at nativecasestudies.evergreen.edu. Um, they have a, a long list of, of case studies primarily from the Northwest, but also some from, from the Southwest and, and other areas. Uh, this was our first contribution and, and we intend to do more. Uh, we were actually gonna host a, a large workshop, a writing workshop on, on case studies this summer in Rapid City uh, with the Enduring Legacies group, but, um, but we, we haven't, we've had to postpone that. It will likely be ne next summer, so kind of look out for that if you're interested. And then finally, our, our tribal advisory boards uh, help to guide everything that we do. And we're always kind of reorganizing and, and designing new boards as we uh, have different projects come up. Uh, in the near future, we're going to be developing a nature and culture trail, interpretive trail on campus. And so we're, we're looking for advisory board members, um, both on the cultural side, but also on the art side, because this is a, a kind of a combination of culture, nature, art, um, and, and all the STEM and STEAM uh, concepts that we're trying to fuse together into an interpretive uh, trail uh, on campus. And so we are looking for, for other members that might be interested in, in the region. Uh, so with that, hopefully I didn't run over too much, but if you're interested in the academic program, the environmental science, A AS or BS, then Mandy Gwynn is, is the person that you would contact. Her information is at the top there. Uh, the, the team at the Intertribal Research and Resource Center is, is listed there. Uh, myself, Anna, who is the outreach coordinator, Emily and Gorjat are the uh, research faculty whose primary job is in research. And then we are hiring an admin assistant um, very soon in the next couple of weeks. So if anything you saw in here piques your interest and you have some skills in, in administrative assistant or know anybody that has those skills, then please uh, have them watch our jobs page uh, for some more information on there. So that is all that I have. And I know we have, we have another presenter, so I don't know if I'm, I think we'll take questions after that point. If, if I understand correct. Yes, and um, as Wendy's switching over to her screen, I will ask one question that has popped up for you. Um, if you wanna stop sharing your screen so Wendy can hop on. Um, this is from Christine Robinson. Um, who is responsible for c connecting people with jobs in their field? So at tribal colleges, a lot of times that, that everything falls back on the faculty on, on some level. Um, it, it depends on kind of how we transition, but, but the tribal college faculty are really um, advisors, they're counselors, they're, they're career services folks. And so, so part of that I, I always think is, is my job or the other faculty's job to link them with uh, potential employers. Um, we have an internship program that, that has students out at agencies. We have, I think, three students working for USDA this summer, um, about 10 miles away. Um, but we also have a career services office on campus and um, and that office has been amazing. It's a, a new director in the last year and she has been fantastic about following up through internship programs, making sure students are paid. Uh, we actually have a, a career closet on campus that provides some, some clothing, uh, business clothing if the students don't have access to those. Um, so it, it's a group effort, a team effort. Uh, but the, the jobs are available for students uh, in the region if they're, if they're looking for, um, for those jobs here in, in North, the Northern Plains. Thank you. And Wendy, I'm seeing your presenter screen if you want to switch, trade your screens. There you go. All right, you're good to go. All right, did it again. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, hang on, sorry, sorry, sorry. Trying to move this where I can see some people's faces. Um, so, Hadalas, at untis untigu de le lagen, gist akas gustrik a lagen, 
Stas dis digwai kaigan a u ijung. The hadas um, di klingai klakia ai gagen. Stas lawa hinu dekeong. Windy smite yatsa kit hinu dekeong. Donna Douglas di al u ijung. Alec and Ruth Douglas di chin di nan u ijung. Sam, Elsie Douglas, Di Chin Di Nanu Ijung, Sanuhat, Kate, Di Chin Di Nanu Ijung, Hikta Handalai Stuth Ijung, Gisqua Hawan Delin Lagen. So I said, uh, good people, I'm happy to be here with you today. I'm Alaska Native Haida of the Eagle Maniety of the Fish Egg House, and I'm an indigenous scientist. And uh, my Haida name is Kstathlua. Uh, my iron name is Wendy Smythe, and as most of you um, in your communities, I am, I told you who my family was because I'm more than an individual. I'm part of a, a family, um, a community, and a tribal nation. So I told you that I'm the daughter of Donna Douglas, the granddaughter of Alec and Ruth, the great-granddaughter of Sam and Elsie, the great-great-great great granddaughter of Sanuhut and Kate, and my people come from Heidelberg, Alaska. I'm a geoscientist. I work in environmental groundwater systems, looking at microbial uh, diversity and geochemistry and mineralization of uh, fossil formation of bacteria. I also um, tie in a lot of the work that I do into my tribal community into geoscience education, and I've been doing that for 12 years. And on my journey, uh, I feel like my ancestors have been dragging me around the country. I say I'm a displaced Alaska native. So uh, I did two years in Michigan, uh, two years in, in DC as a AAAS fellow at NSF. And now I've just landed in, um, on my way back towards the Pacific Northwest. So I'm in uh, Duluth, Minnesota. I just started, I just completed my first year as faculty and, and it's and I feel like I'm really guided to be where I'm at. It's the first time in my career that I've been able to do um, both science research and native education and outreach without having to try to justify one or the other, but both fit, fit together. So I'm in two departments, Earth and Environmental Science and American Indian Studies. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing in my tribal community and then um, about what I'm doing here briefly in Duluth. So uh, the talk is Indigenous Geoscience, Community Research and Education and Student Experiences. And so, let's see if I can scroll here. Uh-oh, there it goes. Okay, so the work that I do within my own tribal community is to advance STEM diversity um, in an effort to create culturally aligned STEM education or science education programming for our students, while also providing materials, um, science materials, for the teachers that come in because none of our teachers are from our community and they have different perspectives they have different worldviews, and they have different ways of um, viewing science and so there's this disconnect between our student worldviews and the teachers and so we need to bring those teachers to a place to meet the students where they are and to respect and understand and acknowledge that there's a different worldview and so when i talk about diversity in science i'm also talking about not only cultural and um, but I'm talking about discipline. We need to have students able to um, come in from ge um, geology, hydrology, social science. We need all these together to really increase innovation, creativity, and productivity, which is things that science always wants to do. And if we think all alike, are we really innovative? And what does that innovation look like? And so for that, I'm gonna, there's a, a picture of a, a red cedar log here. And so if we call that, if we view that as our hypothesis or a question or a problem or something we need to solve, if I asked you all, we would get a range of questions of what would you do with that log? You're given that log and told to do something with it. What would you do? Would you take the bark and make clothing? Would you weave it into a basket? Would you make a house? Furniture? What would you do? And so if we all have these same worldviews, we end up with the same thing. But the Haidas, we made canoes. We figured out how to tie engineering and material science um, into an oceanography 
into how to turn this log into a way of solving a problem of moving from one location to another. And so I always like to say in our diversity part of science, a jiwadluan, a dudalkwag, and everything is related. Everything is related and we need each other and we need each type of knowledge to survive. And so for the culturally aligned curriculum, the purpose was to empower and encourage students. And that is supporting them and giving them the confidence to see themselves, their culture, and their community when they take a science class and to really envision themselves as scientists. We also want to engage with teachers by again giving them um, curriculum that was grounded in Haida knowledge from our worldview so that they can meet our students where they are and they can teach in a way that the student engages and doesn't feel like they're talking about something that they've never heard of before. Um, and of course it's standards aligned. And so we did that by starting with our culture, adding our language, and then developing curriculum, <laughs> working with teachers. And we did this in place because where we live, so Heidelberg is uh, in rural Alaska, 350 people in the community. We are cultural and traditional use. So most of our food is subsistence and we rely on the environment and the changes in that environment for the sustainability of our community. So the way we coupled these knowledge systems together using traditional knowledge in STEM. So I like to think of um, traditional knowledge is there's no edges. It's holistic. Everything is there. You just have to know what to look for. And our, our students, have grown up with it. So they, they know it's there, they just don't, when, when we ask them, um, what do you know about geology? What do you know about ecology? What do you know about chemistry? They typically tell us they don't know. I don't know, I've never heard of that. We talk about to us, how many people have worked with a high school kid and asked them about pH? What do you get? You get kids, like these eyes rolling up in the head, they're falling asleep. They don't engage because it doesn't, it, it's not relevant. So we step back and we said, okay, we have, spruce root hats and baskets. That is something they're familiar with. They make them and they harvest the materials to make them. And so we deconstructed, we took an object that everyone is used to. They know how to make them. And we said, how did you do this? Let's take it apart and walk backwards. And so we did that, um, asked the students, where did you find your materials? How did you prepare your materials? And we started getting these little bits of, of Western science coming out. And I say Western science because it's compartmentalized and separate. It's not all tied together. When we get into academia, we don't have classes that cross every um, discipline, typically. And so the students started talking about how you had to have an environment that was sandy or loamy. Well, that's geology, so that your roots aren't stringy, because um, if the rocks are there, the roots grow around it and you can't weave it. Um, so then there's biology through the ecology because they know where to find them. Um, they also talk about uh, you can't have acidic soil. So I have chemistry there now um, because again, <laughs> excuse me, um, the material becomes frail and you can't, you can't weave with it. Uh, they talk about, then we get into weaving, there's math involved in that. And so we start pulling all these out and there's also the social science component. When we go into the forest, we have a relationship with the forest. We have a relationship with those plants and the rocks. And we go there knowing that we have a relationship with the people we're with and with the spirits in the forest. Everything has a spirit and we have to respect that. And so as we have these two knowledge systems, we want our students to be able to think and sharpen their critical thinking skills. They know the traditional knowledge, they know the um, the science that they're learning in school. So we couple them together. So now everything is connected in one system again. So the students are learning to think in two different ways and can respond in two different ways. So now when they go to academia, go leave school, leave the community and go to college, they can think it's not, it's not too much of a struggle now because it's a system that they're used to and they know how to relate it to their tradition and they know how to relate it to um, a discipline specific. Here's an example of these two knowledge systems of what our curriculum is looking like. So some of it's around ocean acidification and how that impacts resources for the community. So shellfish um, and um, eelgrass. 
we look at our totem poles. We have old totem poles that are two, three hundred years old, and we have new totem poles. And so, if we start doing cores of those tr of those totem poles, uh, we have a um, do, through dendrochronology, we start getting this three, four, five hundred year history, climate history of the region. And then finally, we use our creation story. Sorry, I have allergies. <laughs> we start using our creation story um, to teach evolution, anatomy, and physiology. And so what we do is we take a, a story, so creation story, for example, and we develop a lesson plan for that one story from K to 12th grade. So they hear that story every year. They're familiar with it. They hear it already. And we tie a different science lesson to it. And this is for a few different reasons. It's to get them familiar, to, to realize that our knowledge system, there's no hierarchy. Traditional knowledge and Western science, not one is not better than the other. We have different ways of knowing the world and traditional knowledge has sustained our community since time immemorial. We also reached out to some of the youth in the community to develop the curriculum. So at the bottom corner on the left is Harley Bell Holter. He provided um, some of the stories. And again, before we put stories into curriculum, I want to be clear. We actually, we do talk to the elders, we do talk to the community, and we get permission to incorporate and use that knowledge um, outside the community. Um, so he, he uh, provided the stories and then each of these lessons has a video at the end in Haida and in English uh, that Harley provides. And then in the right corner is um, <laughs> Lauren Smythe and she's the artist um, that does the artwork for the curriculum and she also, um, we, we dump everything on her and say put it together and she magically does it. It's really amazing to see. <laughs> um, no pressure on her since she has the same last name as me, right? Um, so we, we work with them to do this. And so then, okay, sometimes my slide will change and sometimes it won't. There we go. So why does it matter? Why do we want to tie these two systems together? What, why do our people need to know? We, we have been there for hundreds of years and survived hundreds of years, but we have something happening. Okay, we have climate change happening. Uh-oh, go back. Um, and in Alaska, and we're in Southeast Alaska, we're having some rapid impacts on our um, food sovereignty. Um, most, as I said before, I think um, 70 to 80% of the diet of people in the community come off the land and water. And so when we start having these climate impacts, intensified storms, um, changes in temperature, which move our berries to a different location, people have these traditional berry sites to pick berries. And you'll have an elder who's 90 years old going out and picking her own berries. Well, when the temperature changes and those berries move higher elevation and there's no cars, it's hard to access. And the, now, the importance of the berry, people harvest these to the point that you have an entire chest freezer full. That is your vitamin source for the, for the winter. So these are very important resources. There's different teas, there's spruce root tips, um, seaweeds and salmon. And so this is the main food sources. And if we start impacting, well, if climate change starts impacting these environments, it impacts our food sovereignty. And so we need to start having our people proactively um, address these issues, uh, raise awareness of these issues, and figure out how we're going to get through this next phase of, um, during climate, of climate change. And so that's why we um, tie these projects and the students do work with the tribe. We put summer internships in for them. They come back, uh, if they go to college, they come back home and they work with the tribe in the summertime. And then the students in high school and in junior high um, conduct research uh, throughout the year. And so one of the experiments that the students did with the shipworm study, they were uh, monitoring the health of the environment at one of our local docks and found that there was um, severe sewage contamination as well as um, fuels and from boats, um, acids from marine batteries. And so they put together, you know, they collected the data, we put it together and gave it to the tribe. And the tribe got $3 million from the state to clean up that area. And we continued to do the study and we saw a rapid within a year change in the um, environment. And so people had no, were no longer swimming there because they would get rashes on their bodies, and now you can go swimming there. So um, the students are very active within the community, and we teach them that this is, this is yours, and we are only passing through, and we have to show you how to take care of it when we leave.
and that's what they do. They come to city council meetings, um, they come to environmental meetings, and they are very proactive. But when we first started, we weren't, we weren't at that phase. Um, here's a word cloud on the left. And when we first asked 75 students, um, male and female, what a scientist was in the beginning of this project, this is what they told us. And so in a word cloud, the largest word is the most dominant word they said. And as they get smaller, they said it less frequently. But what you can see is 75 students said white, male, there's no females represented here and 60% of the student body was female. And then lab coat, like stereotypical things is what they said. So that told us that they did not see themselves in science. And this is where I met Althea. And so I started bringing in um, indigenous scholars, engineers, oceanographers, educators to come in with me when we would work at the school and do science fairs um, to show the students that there is a different narrative. We are scientists, we are lawyers, we're doctors, we're professionals. Because typically what our students see and what we see is how mainstream society presents us and that's not who we are. So we wanted to show the students a different narrative. And we did that for a year and a half and asked them again. And what you can start to see is there's a shift and there's an increase in the de definition of words, but there's a shift. Now a scientist is smart. Now a scientist can be a male and a female. So the girls are now identifying. That's a, that's a, a fundamental shift in ideology. Again, here we have native is being represented. That wasn't there before. Now they're seeing themselves as a scientist. They're tying in core cultural values of yachtam, which is respect. So they're tying in who they are and their culture into what a scientist is. It was beautiful to see. And the other thing that was really interesting when I was going through this is some of the students started putting a, um, physical characteristics of themselves in here. They were tall, they were short, they had curly hair. What that tells us is that student see, is defining themselves as a scientist, something they didn't see before. And that's just from infusing what they know in culture into what they're learning at school. Looking at a 10 year cohort of these students in red is the 10 year cohort that um, uh, I worked with, with several um, indigenous scientists and scholars. And then uh, in the gray bars is the cohort ahead of these students that we didn't, um, had not engaged with. And what we see is um, before the, um, I guess intervention or interaction with our with my community, 19% were going to college, but 5% were graduating. So what we're what we're seeing is they were going, they were not finishing. There was a reason why. Now we have uh, there at 60%. It changes year to year. It's such a small community it depends on how many graduate and how many go to college. Right now we're at 65% are going to college or trade school. We saw a decrease in early childbirth of, of students in high school or immediately after we saw a dramatic decrease in addictive behaviors. Because what we have done is we have shifted the story. The students no longer see themselves reflected in what mainstream media tells us we are. They see their culture and their life as being a scientist. They see what they're doing having value to their community and to their family because they are doing research in their community that is helping their tribe. And that is uh, life changing for a student to be able to realize that they have that much impact. And so that is where I'm wrapping up with, with what I've been doing in my tribal community. Um, what I do now, we have a program, um, Master of Tribal Resource and Environmental Stewardship at UMD. It's the program that I'm teaching and it's a, in American Indian Studies, but it's a science program, a geoscience program. And so we, it's a two year program, it's a professional degree. Most of our, um, it was built through consultation with the tribes and state. And um, we just graduated our first cohort and our second one is enrolling. And very exciting to be able to tie and house a science program in American Indian studies and, and, and teach it from a traditional knowledge perspective, not just in high school, but in a professional graduate program. And with that, I would ask you, who is telling your story? 
at any given moment, you have the power to say, this is not how the story is going to end. This is not how the story is going to be told. This is not my story. Just because society tells us who we are doesn't mean we have to accept it. You have a voice because depending on who tells your story, you see a very different picture. If you look at those two images at the bottom of Standing Rock, who is telling each of those stories and which one reflects who we are? And with that, I'll show you one last thing. Um, currently, we have a letter out. It's a challenge to um, science to end racist behavior. So a cohort of nine geoscientists got together, wrote this letter, and it's, it's out to be endorsed. If you want to read it, we're trying to, I'm the only Native on there, and I am not the only voice for Native Americans. We need to have, I want to challenge um, our Indigenous brothers and sisters to join this call to ask academia, funding agencies, nonprofits to truly and meaningfully engage with indigenous communities with us, work with us, don't work on us. Um, and so if you wanna read that letter, um, you can read it, that's the link for it. Um, you can also endorse it. Um, we've challenged several um, senators to join on. We've challenged several um, large organizations to join on and so far, in 24 hours, we've gotten a thousand signatures. And so with that, I'll say hawa, dangant kolagen. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Wendy. That was great. And um, you know, I cannot get emotional and just it's amazing to be able to work with you, know you over the years and yeah, and be, being able to, to um, partner today and, and um, hearing your story and it's just and by the comments you know you have a standing ovation right now and um yeah we're all inspired by the work that you're doing i have um, to try to cry too because <laughs> Leah was the first native i brought home that that no one knew what i did i didn't talk about being a graduate student i started this when i was a graduate student and we don't talk about what we do it's not proper to do that our family does that and so the kids i remember althea when you asked them what does she do? And they said something like, she travels around and helps kids. And Althea was like, no, she's a graduate student. And, and uh, but Althea was the first role model they saw as um, an indigenous scientist. And I thank you so much for that. Um, I'm so fortunate to have met you um, when I was in graduate school and you came into the program. Thank you. Um, so we will open up for questions. And I did have a question from Susan. Um, that I wrote down and I wanted to get back to, and it's for Jeremy. It says, you mentioned having NASA partners. Have you worked with America View slash North Dakota View at UND for geospatial technologies outreach and training? Sure, I responded directly to okay. her, but uh, but shortly the, the North Dakota Space Grant Consortium is, is a collaboration that's run out of UND, University of North Dakota. And I'm not sure how closely those two groups work together, but I assume that there's, there's interaction there. Um, but I will follow up. Thank you for the, the information. All right, and if anybody else had a question, you can um, either type it into the chat box or um, if you have your video up, you can raise your hand and I will call on you. And I'm gonna share my screen. I'm trying to add links on. I'm trying to add links that people are asking for. I'm going to share my screen. Dr. Wildcat? Yes. Well, first of all, thank you both Jeremy and Wendy for an ex I mean outstanding presentations. But it strikes me that one of the things that you both illustrate, and I think there's a great need, uh, and I wanted to see if either of you have, have, have written on this topic, um, and that is to explain to those um, sort of in mainstream Western science that they ought to be seeking out indigenous students because they don't think in the boxes and the silos that that haunt us all and i really think we have an opportunity to 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 get more of our young people engaged if we can 
share that and 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 demonstrate, you know, to uh, those in major dominant institutions that they need to be actively searching out indigenous students who are connected to their traditions, who know their worldviews, and this would be a great addition to their to their programs and and to their research. So, just wondering if either of you have 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 written about that or made presentations on that. I, I think it's really important. Uh, most of what I've been writing about is um, the importance of traditional knowledge and how to use it in an ethical and respectful way, because that's the key, right? It, right. it not be extractive. And we get a lot of that and we have to be very careful. Um, so I, I, I mo a lot of the work I do is around that, but I do, um, that's why I'm so excited about coming to UMD though, is this new graduate program and, and working with indigenous graduate students. And my lab is dedicated, I, well, once it gets open, I just got it right before everything happened. And so once we get the lab up and running, I really wanna, um, it's focused around having indigenous students in a safe space where they feel like they can use their traditional worldviews and their traditional knowledge mm -hmm. and not be chastised for it. Mm -hmm. Cause that's a really hard thing to do. And one of the things I do too, in my introduction, I do make a point to say I'm an indigenous scientist because mm -hmm. academia wants to pull one part of us, Yeah. right? They want one part of us and they want the brain, but we are both, we have both our brain and our heart that we use. And so um, I'm trying to create a safe space for that and, and encourage students to take back their voice and not lose their voice because it can, the world wants to stomp that out of us and we have to empower and encourage students to to take that stand and mentoring them and, and showing them that we're here to taking the you know doing it too that's mostly what i've done thank you all right I have a and I, I, oh, oh go ahead sorry oh sorry i, I, I yeah. was just going to add i i i also have not done much in writing on that that's a that's a great opportunity that's that that mm -hmm. we're missing um most of my conversations are usually with uh, potential graduate advisors or or as a student moves into a career field if they're linking with one of our um, internship um, collaborators uh, and and understanding that on on their side to to identify exactly what you said is that there's this this opportunity that that shouldn't be missed mm -hmm. and it, it it is about respecting the worldview and the different ideas and suddenly there's a, a solution that 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 person would have never thought of yes so absolutely, I think there's an opportunity to, to get that down in, in some other format than individual conversations. All right, I have a question from Carly McClellan. Is UTC looking for partners? An example would be the Navajo Nation Water Management Branch in student research. If yes, then what are the logistics to make that happen? Hi, Carly. Uh, we met um, not too long ago, so it's good to, good to hear from you again. Uh, we're looking for partners all over. We, we primarily work in the Northern Plains area, but we, we are happy to work in wherever there is a need and wherever makes sense to, to you. Um, so, so we can certainly connect and, and see how we can work on either training or specific technical um, aspects. So, so yeah, please contact me again. All right, and the next question is from Christine Robinson. Are there native science fairs and or job fairs that happen annually? If so, could you share that information? <laughs> I don't know how to answer. I think there's a, there's a, ask that question again. There's, there's quite a lot going on. There's a lot of conferences and meetings, you know, um, my, uh, first year as a fellow at NSF, I had this amazingly great travel budget and I hit every native conference, science conference I could go to, to hear the voices of what those communities were saying. And it was amazing to see, not really, that everybody said the same thing, work with us, not on us, respect our knowledge systems and, and meaningfully support our students and recruit them, recruit them and support them. Um, but there's a, if you do is what, what region of the country are you in? They're all over there. There's some in Seattle, there's in Michigan. Um, there's a lot of different conferences and organizations. Um, depending on what you're looking for, we can, I can 
send a list of that to Althea if you want. Yeah, and I think too, the first two that come to mind, the bigger ones, um, the American Indian Higher Edu or American Indian Science and Engineering Society, um, which is national, regional. Um, and I, that's where I actually got my opportunity in the internship um, where I was able to meet um, Wendy. And then the other one is SACNIS, the Society for Advancing Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. So I think if you um, look to those two organizations, I think the opportunities will branch out into the other um, opportunities out there for students in STEM. And yes, Alicia, thank you for putting up the um, spelling for the acronyms. Um, yeah. Any other questions? And then also Falcon has student research presentations. And I will save the chat. And um, as we work on this website and developing the website for this group, this information and resources um, will be shared, um, anything related to this group. Any other last questions as we're at the top of the hour? So um, just, I wanna say thank you um, from the bottom of my heart to Wendy, to Jeremy, um, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Um, this was great. And, you know, hopefully there's more opportunities in the future to partner and collaborate um, in, in the future. And hopefully, um, you know, I think as this group, as we move forward in this only being our second virtual gathering, but as we move forward, you know, we hope that these larger um, conversations, the topics that are being talked about, um, that they inspire you in the work that you're doing, whether that's regionally, locally, within your communities, even just within your own um, department, um, but that it inspires um, your conversations as you, as you leave us here today, um, and that we find ways um, to relate to one another, um, and that in the future, um, when we all come back together in person, that we've painted a large picture of, of addressing climate change in our indigenous communities um, for the rest of the world. So thank you everybody for joining us today. This webinar will be, uh, has been recorded um, and I will send out information on where you can find the recordings and future registration for um, future virtual gatherings. And um, please take care. Uh, blessings to you and your loved ones. Thank you.